I'd like to use for a sermonic theme this morning, destination-minded, destination-minded. In the era of childhood which I grew up, there was this thing called the latchkey kid. For those of you that were born after me, or maybe even before me, or lived in a different cultural climate, this was a kid who was entrusted with a key to the house and expected to get from school all the way home by themselves, most likely because their parents were working. So I was one of those kids, entrusted to get home by 3.30 every day to answer the call surely my mom would be putting in to make sure that I had got home okay. Except one day, that same bully I told you about about a month ago that tried to take my Butterfinger candy, well, her and her partner appeared on the scene and tried to get me and my friend to take another route home. My friend said yes, but because I was of that time period and culture that feared our parents more than we did God, I declined the invitation. I said goodbye to my friend and I made my way home to the 3.30 phone call, which by the way, I never ever missed during my latchkey days. It gave purpose to my legs and it gave purpose to my mind. And because I had a destination, it even helped me to say no to the bullies at my school. It's good to have some sense of where you are going and your own sense of purpose in the world. This is where we enter the biblical text today. That was a little bit convoluted. We're looking at Esther. And oftentimes we don't get to go to the Old Testament, but today we're looking at that famous character. There are also some other interesting characters in the text today. Haman, Mordecai, King Xerxes, also known as Ahasuerus. And then we have Esther. Esther was guided by her relative pseudo-surrogate father, Mordecai. She had tried out for a pageant and it was her purpose and understanding to get in good with the king. Now the king was a show off with a short fuse and could be played better than a bagpipe, but strategy was important. He was easily triggered and Esther withheld her identity and played up her beauty. And all of the plotting and scheming worked because Esther ended up being his second wife. And time was of the essence because Haman, the king's right-hand man, was offended by Mordecai's action and made it his mission in life to annihil uh, oh, I can't get that word. He made it his mission in life to kind of knock off the Israelites. Now Esther learned of what was to happen. And Esther knew that her position with the king was solely to be of benefit to her people. And she never forgot that. And so all of her actions and time were spent with this in mind. She was destination-minded. Her people mattered. I am a representation of my people. And so Esther began to plot and scheme again. And so when the king was feeling really, really good one evening and asked Esther to name whatever she wanted, it was then that she revealed her identity. She revealed the plans of Haman, and she asked the king quite persuasively to save her people. And the king granted her her wish. Esther could have enjoyed the luxuries of her title, which often many do. She could have enjoyed the materialism that was available to her. But because of her destination-minded abilities, it was about the whole community and not just her. There are three reasons that being destination-minded is important. First and foremost, having a destination gives us purpose. Esther and the kid Charlene, they had purpose. Esther, even with some guidance from Mordecai, was never able to forget she was not on this earth just so she could squeeze out of life what she could get. But a whole people needed her advocacy. In fact, Mordecai says to Esther in the text, do not think at this time relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. Do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. But you and your family and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. You know, they didn't mix words in the Bible, and so he let her have it. But those words gave her a destination, and being destination-minded gives purpose. A couple of weeks ago, I was at an event where Jesse White tumblers were performing. Have any of you seen the Jesse White tumblers? I mean, how many of you have seen them? They're pretty known in Chicago. 
Our family has always enjoyed watching the Jesse White tumblers perform. From the look of the crowd, we were not alone. People were sitting and kids were excited and there was a crowd gathering as they were setting up. Well, Jesse White, you know, is the Secretary of the State. Maybe what some people don't know is he also works with this tumbler team. Jesse has a full-time job. He makes good money. But on the side, Jesse works with this group of kids and he showed up. He showed up in the white van with the kids. He helped set up. He was moving around. He is older, no doubt. He was bent over, but Jesse was moving. And so most of the time when I've listen or watch the Jesse White Tumblers, I just get into them flipping and I get into the action. But this day, I got a chance to really, really listen to him. And he starts out and says, the only herbs we eat are salt and pepper. So I had to break that down to my son because I knew that the whole herb thing went right over his head, that he was referring to illegal substances. He also began to explain what are the rules to be in the Jesse White Tumblers and the GPA that's needed and just like that, he's given kids purpose. They like what they see and they want to be a part of this group. It's cool to go places and flip in the air and get applauses and wear those uniforms. But if you want to be a part of this group, well, guess what? You got to follow these rules. In fact, when I did my own research, it says the group started in 1959. And it started, it was started to give inner city youth a positive alternative. He has helped kids go on to college. So one, being destination-minded gives purpose. The second reason it's good to be destination-minded, it's important to give you a map for where you want to go and keen insights when you are not headed in the right direction. A couple in Chicago years ago were traveling to the South. Their family lived in the South, and on their way back, it seemed like the husband may have took a wrong turn. He didn't seem so confident in where he was driving. His wife asked him, "Hun, do you, do you know where you're going? Are you, are you sure you know where you're going? And just like that, he says, yes, I think I got it. But she didn't want to offend him, and she didn't want to step on his toes, so she waited another 20 minutes when it seemed like, you know, I don't know if this is the way back. And she asked him again. So this went on for about an hour and a half, and by the time they pull into the gas station, guess what? They were way headed the wrong way. They were not headed back to Chicago. But my thing is, if they had never had a destination, they would have never known that they were lost. If they had never had a destination, they would have never known that they were going in the wrong direction when they finally stopped at the gas station. Destination gives us green lights. It gives us yellow lights. It gives us red lights. Even when we don't want to adhere, it can indicate that maybe we're not going in the right direction. A week ago, City Hall the city council calls me up on a Friday afternoon and they asked me to do invocation on a Monday. Denise, you know, make sure I get the phone call. This is an important phone call. And a few years ago, I would have said, yes, 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 I'm there. But I already had three appointments Monday and this is my time and you're calling me on a Friday to do an invocation on a Monday. That means parking, that means rearranging my schedule. I already had my weekly goals and now someone calls me in the ninth hour expecting me to drop everything I'm doing because it's the city council to go pray. I said, no. The guy calling seemed like he was actually offended, but you asked me at the ninth hour. And you know why I was able to say no? because I'm destination-minded. Doing an invocation really wouldn't have done anything, I don't think, and some of you might have said, maybe it would have. I already knew the altar woman. I already see Lori Lightfoot at the basketball games. But for me, I have a lot to do. And as I've grown older, God has helped me to see that not every open door is one that I should walk through. Maybe not every open door to you is one that you should walk through. Not every time somebody calls me up with the emergency is it my emergency. Sometimes it's their emergency. And sometimes by simply pausing, I can help them enter into a relationship with God and figure out their emergency. What am I trying to say? That being destination-minded means that sometimes we can say no to things because those things don't take us in the direction that God has us going in the first place. Where are you trying to go? Where, what are we trying to do here at United? And now I can better recognize where I am 
and when I'm lost and when I'm really, really off because God has helped me to be more destination-minded. Two, being destination-minded gives you a map for where you want to go and it helps you see when you're really, really off and when you're lost. I was listening to this motivational speaker and he was sharing how he made a nice penny already and then his wife got MS and he began to learn about the disease in her case and one of the things he determined was that he needed to be the primary breadwinner and so he went from being a motivational speaker to being one of the best motivational speakers in the country because he was no longer just doing motivational speaking as a job but he was doing it for his whole family his destination shifted. And with his shift, the way in which he treated his job changed. He put a lot more energy into it. Once his destination changed, so did how he governed himself and how he did his work. And last, being destination-minded helps you to prioritize your life. Have you ever felt overwhelmed like you have all these tasks? What comes first? What comes second? Jesus was a destination-minded person. For the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about him telling the people, hey, look, I'm about to go. I'm about to get out of here. I'm about to wind down. My time on earth is about to expire. And they didn't want to hear it. But he knew from the beginning what he was sent to earth to do. He had a specific person, per purpose. He was not here forever, but he was here for a time. And like it or not, we're not here forever either though we like, might like to think we are. And so he prioritizes his time. He was with people, and then he was away in retreat. And that's pretty much the combination he worked with. And when he was on, it was all about the people. And sometimes the disciple couldn't understand, why aren't you eating? Because it's about the people. I have food that you know not of. Here is Esther, an orphan, sitting in a place of prestige at just the right time to protect her people. But what if she hadn't spoken up? Are we being quiet? What if she had been too scared to speak? Are we too scared to speak? What if she had just decided to care about herself? Isn't that what Americans are doing, basically? What if she had shrunk from the task? Most Greek, great leaders at some point have to take steps that might or might not get them killed. Her relationship with the king allows her to ask that he rescue her people. And she got her wish granted, but it could have went the other way. Her decision to speak was a risk that could have backfired. The most important thing on Esther's plate was speaking up for her people. And we know she was preceded by Queen Vashti, and things didn't go exactly right for Queen Vashti, but that's another sermon for another day. I've been following Afghanistan since the United States pulled out, and I need to offer this disclaimer. I am under no illusion that America has done some awful things abroad and that we are not just pure promoters of democracy. We've not been kind in other countries. We don't talk about it, but I don't believe this narrative that America puts forth. So I need to put that disclaimer out here. So moving right along, right after the military left, a group of women began to protest in Afghanistan. And I thought, if this is not a death wish, I don't know what is. I was shocked that these women decided to come out and protest against the Taliban. Like, had they lost their mind? And they were beaten up for sure, and they came back the next day and the next day, and they were steadfast. And I can't forget the words of one lady. I would rather die a quick death standing for what I believe than to cower and die a slow death. This lady knows her priorities, and like Esther, what is at stake? There's a lot at stake in our world, and it's always been the little people, not the giants, the housewives, not the elected officials, the Esthers, not the kings, the Vashtis, not the kings, the young adult, not the established professionals that have too much to lose by shaking the system, that at the right time take a stand for what is ultimately right. You know, I've been watching this movie with Malcolm X in it, and what's interesting is he knew there was a good chance that he would get killed. He had death threats. He had vandalization come to his home. He was never violent, but he believed that change came with oppressed folks standing up for themselves. And his split with the nation came when they only wanted a religious organization, and he saw a social analysis as well. 
and Malcolm knew where his life was headed, but he couldn't stop talking. He couldn't stop speaking. He couldn't back down from what he believed was the liberation of black people. My people matter. He could not nor Martin, even though they both grew weary and they were stressed. The destination for them was important like Esther for her people. What is your destination? Where are you trying to go? Are you all over the map or do you, are you destination minded? At a young age, my parents gave me somewhere to be. I didn't even know how important destination was at that point. Because I look at kids today and they don't have nowhere to be. And when kids don't have nowhere to be, that equals trouble. That's important. It was important that I arrived at home by a certain time to get the phone call. The goal kept me on track. It kept me from getting into trouble. It kept me from taking the wrong way home. It kept me from hanging out in the streets. It kept me destination minded. I got to get home by a certain time if I want peace in my life and I want my behind to feel good. My cousins across the way didn't have that same expectation. They didn't have that and they got in a heap of trouble. And since then, and since they didn't have anywhere to be, they were everywhere and ended up on drugs and alcohol. I get what Jesse White is saying expectations and being destined minded not only kept me out of trouble but it set me on a path to success it's important for us as people of God to have a destination to have a purpose to have a place to be and to have an assignment from God amen <laughs>